Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bohemi O'Sullivan. I'm the uh, program manager here at Power America, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. We have these uh, techni web technical webinars once a month, uh, typically on the first Wednesday of the month, and uh, we present some of our ongoing research projects and share results and also try to get feedback from a pretty broad audience. So you're welcome to attend any of the subsequent webinars. Our next will be on the Wednesday, the 7th of September, and uh, Dr. Lukic from NC State will present his work related to development of a wide band gap based uh, fast charger, and Dr. Hussein will present a project related to development of an uh, uh, electric vehicle inverter. But today, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Fred Lee of Virginia Tech, and I'll give a brief uh, bio of Dr. Lee, and then I'll let him proceed with uh, two projects that he's going to present today. The first is a uh, high-density, high-efficiency adapter. The second will be uh, high-frequency GAN converters for distributed power systems. I can't read his entire bio. I don't want to take up our entire hour. As you know, Dr. Lee is quite distinguished, but I'll just give you some background. Dr. B is a university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech and the founder and director of the National Science Foundation Center for Power Electronic Systems, a preeminent academic center in power electronics research at Virginia Tech. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, an academician of Taiwan Academia Sinica, and a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering in China. <clears throat> Dr. Lee has supervised the completion of 80 PhD and 89 MS students. He holds 77 U.S. patents and has published over 277 journal articles and more than 702 referee technical papers. According to Microsoft H Index, he is rated among the top three best cited authors for over 2.5 million engineering authors in the world. His research interests include high-frequency power conversion, magnetics and EMI, distributed power systems, renewable energy, power quality, high-density electronics packaging, and integration and modeling control. And with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, I would like, before I begin, though, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking. Uh, Dr. Lee will present for approximately 20 minutes, and then when we get to the Q&A, because of a large number of attendees, please use the chat button on your WebEx uh, application, and I'll read the questions so everyone can hear, should hear. Okay, Dr. Lee, please proceed. Thank you for your introduction, and uh, thank you very much for all of you who are able to join uh, WebEx. We have uh, seven people uh, in this room, in addition to all the folks uh, linked to the WebEx. So let me get started. Okay. <clears throat> the first topic is uh, on the uh, AC to DC adapter using GAN devices. And uh, first, let me introduce the uh, adapter volume of business for AC-DC adapters. It is roughly somewhere between eight to nine billion dollars. And this is our, our specific adapters related to IT type of industry. From as a small other, uh, we're not counting one watt adapter from a small as a 20, watt to as large as a 300 watt. Now, there's someone on the line uh, not muting if you, there's a, some background noise. If uh, you are able to mute, this would make it easier for the rest of us. Thank you. Okay. The goal number one, efficiency and density. But let's take a look in this picture what is the best one can achieve in terms of uh, power density? This chart basically says, if you have a uniform distribution of uh, heat in, within the black box, 
And if the black box case temperature is maximized at 95 degrees C, and this is uh, actually given as a spec, then these two curves are the maximum power density you can achieve for a given efficiency. Basically, it's a thermally limited. Of course, nobody want, will have an adapter with a surface temperature of 95 degrees C. So normally, the uh, surface temperature of adapter would be around 70 degrees C. So when you touch it with your hands, you don't feel, have the burning sensation. So most of people are targeting 70 degrees C. So the two dot line indicating what would be a theoretical limit of in terms of power density. Now, if you look at today's product, are basically are far away from its uh, theoretical limit. And uh, those are shows in the stars. And what we're targeting is something close to its theoretical limit in the first year go. And so we not only have to improve the efficiency, but we also have to improve the power density. And the key to reach this goal is to run at a switching frequency at least 10 times higher than the uh, industry practice. Okay, so goal number one is uh, we're targeting a 65 watt adapter for such application as MacBook Pro. Yeah, we again, want to make it uh, power adapter thing. We want to make it smaller, so it will be the size of a uh, iPad. Um, this this is a done. There's a background noise. If you can mute your mm -hmm. uh, your side, that would be helpful. And uh, while we're starting this project with 65 watt adapter, <laughs> we have a strong urge from the industry side. I still hear a lot of background noise. If you can mute your speaker, that would be very helpful. Thank you. And as we start the program, industry, I hear quite a few input from industry says, really the mainstream today is 45 watts. So we have to change your course. But at the end, within the first year, we have actually accomplished two goals. One adapter at 65 watt, the other adapter at 45 watt. So for 45 watt adapters, our goal is to make it smaller than iPad. So roughly about two thirds of the size. Goal number two. We don't like the way the adapters are made and it is in the manufacturing process very, very labor intensive. And we would like to automate the adapter as much as we can. So the uh, Picture shows in the bottom is our version of the adapter, which are not only smaller, but most of the components within the adapter could be automated. So how do we achieve these two goals? Let me just summarize the key design features. Show what show in this peak picture is is a circuit diagram of the state of the art adapter used in the, in the most of the industry practice. You have a filter in front of it, then you have a rectifier, then you have a flyback converter. Normally you run this converter at about less than 100 kilohertz. But what we do is, of course, we want all the active device to be a wideband gap device, number one, and running at 10 times higher switching frequency. Number two, we want to add another GAN device as a active clamp circuit in order to achieve soft switching. Number three, we want to design magnetic very differently by using integrated PCB. So we cut down labor content. Number four, because of PCB, there are 
be likely more common more noise created due to the winding cap. We mm -hmm. want to implement a shielding concept, which is a, a patent technology developed at CPAS several years ago to improve the EMI. Number five, we want to re simplify the input filter from more than a one-stage filter to a simple one-stage filter. And so let me elaborate these five features. Now, if you use GAN and at the yeah, frequency 10 times higher, you really can see the benefit or the impact of GAN. By simply replacing GAN with the silicon, you see some eff efficiency improvement. I would say that would be short selling the uh, potential of a GAN device. Now, in the, on the right hand side, you can see the turn on energy and the turn off energy. With the GAN device, the turn off energy is very small, almost negligible. Turn on energy is less than silicon, but it is not negligible. As current is going up, the turn on energy increases as, as, as expected. If you compare a silicon device with a GAN, silicon is marked in red, GAN is marked in blue. You can see the turn on loss for GAN is much less. Turn off loss is, is very small. Driver loss is very small. Conduction loss is somewhat smaller. Transformer loss would be higher because we're running a higher frequency. And the leakage, uh, I'm sorry, transformer would be smaller loss and uh, leakage is much higher than silicon device. So we have to deal with this. So first thing uh, is- Yes, we, can, I, can I use the computer for a while? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, first thing we do is we implement zero voltage switching by running in a critical mode. Okay, we knock out the, the completely the turn on loss. Now, next is the dealing with the leakage related loss. If you use a conventional way, it would be a diode clamp network. So if you use diode clamp circuit, there will, you can see a lot of parasitic ringing. The parasitic ringing is a result of leakage inductance in the transformer as well as the junction cap, capacitor in the devices. And uh, by running at a higher frequency, the leakage relay loss will be much higher. So then we replace the, act, the diode clamp circuit with active clamp circuit, and we can recycle the leakage energy so that it would not be present as a loss. This is a familiar technology, and you can see how clean the waveform is. So we knock down the leakage loss. Number three, the transformer usually look like this with a, a hand wand with a core and winding, and usually this is done by hand wand, not a, a very labor intensive process. We'd like to replace that with a PCB-based winding design, okay? And in this particular one, we have 10-turn primary and uh, two-turn secondary. So we use four-layer PCB, so that typically would be the four-layer structure for any PCB, common, the commonly low-cost PCB design. So secondary winding, primary winding, and primary winding and secondary winding. So you have a full layer in this structure, and, and this is a assembled unit. You can see a core, the winding is on the PCB, the core will be just a sandwich to the PCB board. By running at 10 times higher the switching frequency, we can reduce the size uh, by a factor of five. Okay. The issue with PCB winding is when you use PCB winding, there are likely more winding capacitor created between layers. Okay, so this winding capacitor then would induce a common mode current, which is undesirable. So what do we do in this case? Is uh, in this four layer structure, 
we add additional layer between the primary and secondary site. Basically, block the common mode current from going through the, uh, from the primary to the secondary. So we add two additional layer. In the circuit diagram, it looks like this. You have a, a shield layer shielding between the primary and secondary side. Therefore, the current that coming from the primary side through the winding capacitor is blocked by the shield layer and sent back to the primary circuit. So it would not be forming a common mode current. So this is very effective. We have a pattern on this technology. Okay, here basically shows the uh, shield layer structure. With the shield layer structure, you can see the degree of improvement. The blue is with the shielding layer, the red is without shielding layer. There is 27 dB attenuation by merely adding two additional shield layer and is very effective from 100, 150 kilohertz to all the way up to 30 megahertz. You can see this part is particularly important and the shield layer shows very effective in shielding that common mode noise, even at a very high frequency. But the, the, in addition to a significant reduction in common mode noise, we also observe a significant reduction in differential mode noise. Although the intent for the shield layer is to block the common mode noise current, but in fact, this is a long story. I will have to make it short. There is a conversion generally in a topology like this. The common mode noise can become a differential mode noise. So by blocking the common mode noise, we also enhance the differential mode noise. And the detail was report in the report was a, a document in the report. So we have dramatic improvement in the EMI, and therefore. The complicated email EMI filter can be simplified into a single stage filter. Okay, so with all this, we can make a, the filter size reduction by a factor of three. By a factor of three. Okay, so for the okay. 65 watt adapter, am I getting an echo from my? Anybody can help me? How do, how do I do Okay. I'm getting some help. I don't know why I really have to. Okay. 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 By a 4x reduction in and at the same time, more than one person, one and a half, one person, People that are listening need to be. The industry really likes to see the results. Generated. There's a lot of industry of analysis exactly to look at everything. Okay, that's because of the, the high demand is different watts and there's a lot of price. It's not the same, so we it's not much effort to try to use the same design. Target is 45 watt adapter. So we can like max of air, max air. And what we are able to do is the size. Excuse me, Dr. Lee. Is there someone you in the room with you who also logged into the meeting and has their microphone on? And has their microphone on? <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know what happened to it. We've got quite a few people on the line. 
and I do not know who, where the, uh, the echo come from, coming from. It's, it's now it's better, it's gone away. Okay, okay, we didn't do anything here. <laughs> anyway, we tried 45 watt also, we are able to uh, reduce uh, to about two thirds of the iPad size. And this is the, the one shown in here. Then the efficiency improvement, the 45 one if is even greater. There's a more than 2% improvement in efficiency for 45 watt. Okay, then we had a proposal, but uh, uh, to continue this effort on, on building a more universal adapter that can be can be justified for all range of power. And uh, let me just, just just highlight what we have in mind. And for anything greater than 45 watt, you would require power factor correction. So you would add a power factor correction circuit into this, okay? Then if we use the civic GAN device, we'll use the totem post structure for GAN device. The other two uh, switch would be silicon devices switching at the line frequency. And we will then, instead of using flyback converter, we'll use more efficient LLC converter. And uh, so if we take this approach, it would be a two-stage approach that works for anything greater than 75 watt where power factor is required. We believe we can further improve the efficiency and the power density by using this structure. And this structure would work for 90 watt and 150 watt, or even up to 300 watt. This was the general structure. And, uh, <laughs> And, and however, anyway, this proposal was submitted, but it was not funded. And so, and so this is uh, we have just wait for future opportunity to do this. And uh, another idea we have is uh, the bulk cap. Uh, how do we reduce the bulk cap? When you use two-stage configuration, we can improve the ef efficiency further. This is what we anticipate, if further improvement in efficiency at 65 watt. And we can reduce the bulk cap by uh, inject some extent of a third order harmonic to reduce the size of bulk cap. Okay, this is our, our theoretical prediction. By injecting third order harmonic, the bulk cap device can be reduced. And this structure would be considered, even considered possibly for uh, adapter below 75 watt, where power factor is not required. And uh, that's why we call this universal adapter. If the efficiency is of primary concern, the density is of primary concern, maybe you can justify use more complicated structure and gain additional efficiency and power density requirement. And this structure then would work with anything beyond uh, 75 watt. So that is the future work. Any question? We still have a few minutes for questions. Okay, for this is our prediction. For 75 watt, we think we have a, with third order harmonic injection, 35% reduction of bulk cap. With the, with the um, less than 75 watt where harmonic injection can be used only for reducing the bulk cap, we can have a 70% reduction of bulk cap. So further improvement can be done if the two-stage so solution is adopted. Dr. Lee, we do have a few questions that people have submitted, so I'd like to read them to you. The first question is related to slide 11. It says, what is the material for the shielding level and how is it deployed in the PCB? This would be the, you adding two additional layer in the PCB using one ounce, two ounce copper, same amount of copper you use in a 
the uh, four layer was two ounce copper. And so you can just add two additional layer with the uh, coppers on the PCB layer as a, as a shielding. Okay, thank you. The next question is, is there anything greater than 40 watts, 45 watts needed for PFC? I thought that greater than 65 watts needed a PFC. Uh, my understanding is 75 watts. Below 75 watts, no PFC is required. And so no commercial product are just targeting a PFC compliance. So, and essentially no PFC circuit in front of it. Below, above 75 watts, you must have PFC. Okay, the next question is, what are the negative effects of third harmonic injection? Is there anything related to distortion of the line voltage? You, with third order homology, let's say above 75 watts, you need you need a power factor requirement. You need to meet the THD the harmonic requirement. So, so you inject certain amount of third order harmonic, uh, so that you still meet PFC and THD requirement but then you can reduce the bulk cap. So the, the, uh, the benefit is uh, reducing the bulk cap. The negative effect is uh, you're increasing somewhat in the conduction loss. Okay, the next question is, since the bulk of the efficiency improvement for GAN devices was achieved by performing uh, ZVS, why can't you also use ZVS for silicon fat solutions? Well, ZVS, of course, is more desirable for every application, even from the EMI point of view. But ZVS requires you to use, in this particular topology, in a flyback topology, require you to use the uh, active plan circuit. Okay, I don't know if this is a follow-up or part of the same question, but if you oh. use ZVS for silicon set solution, could you achieve one megahertz? And if not, why? I am not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat again? It says, if you use ZVS for silicon set solution, could you achieve one megahertz? And if not, why? If you, the, the reason, the reason for silicon is uh, the, the turn off energy is large. So, and uh, it, it, it's, it is, it's not, you, you, you can use run at a very high frequency and be efficient. So silicon is limited to how, there's a there's a driver loss and there's a turn off loss. Even though you use ZVS, you can't push it for higher frequency. For GAN device, you have this gift that are given to you that turn off loss is negligible. So and so you essentially wipe out all the switching related loss with the silicon with this device, which you never had in the in the past. So that is something very unique for white band gap, particularly for GAN device. You can com almost completely wipe out all the switching related loss. In silicon, you cannot. You start, you're still stuck with turn off loss. You're stuck, still stuck with driver related loss. Okay, the uh, next question just asks you to please refer to the loss breakdown slide. Which page? I'm not sure. It just says please refer to the loss breakdown slide. I guess I think it was near the beginning where you showed the different losses in blue and there? red. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Sixty five watt, okay. Okay, the uh, stress state art state of the art is a is a conventional. The uh, blue is what we did. The switching loss 
is less, conduction loss is less, transformer loss is less, the leakage loss is less, the EMI is less. Now, keep in mind, the state of the art is 100 kilohertz. The, what we did is something greater than one megahertz. You can see the blue switching loss is very small, even at one megahertz, and less than the 100 kilohertz, the uh, silicon device. So switching loss is a very small part of the total loss picture. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's the uh, end of the questions. Uh, you are free to go to your second presentation now. Okay, let me go Thank to my much. second one. The second one is about uh, using GAN device for data center related application. Okay, this page shows data center. Data center, now the larger data center is up to about 20 megawatts. Now for data center, you start to draw power from the medium voltage. Smaller data center will be 4168, and the larger one will be 13.8 kilovolts, and even larger one would, be, would even uh, try, try to draw power from 30 kilovolt uh, utility line. You, you, then you take it, you go through a transformer, you drop down to 480 volts, three phase, runs a lot of power, let's say in this case it was 3,000 amp current through the cable, distributing this power to various data hall. So there is a loss in the cable. Now in the data hall, you have a 480 volt three-phase AC. You want to distribute that to the cabinet level. This is a server cabinet. The server cabinet can only take a single phase. Okay, so you have to drop down the voltage, take a single phase, and distributing the three phase among different cabinets, and so on. So this is the current product. Now keep in mind, the data center will consume 10% of electricity by 2020. 1% improvement in efficiency means 16 terawatt hour. Tera is a unit of 10 to the 12th. 16, 10 to the 12th order watt hours. Now, keep in mind, every bit of power that you dissipate in here need air condition to cool it down, so we'll modify that by a factor of two, then you also consume electricity to cool it down. Okay, 1% efficiency improvement is equivalent to the 6, 4.6 nuclear power plant, the output of that, each one is rated at one gigawatt capacity, about, about the average nuclear power plant size. So 1% improvement in the data center efficiency means saving the power saving from a 4.6 4 nuclear power plant. Keep that in number in mind because I'm going to use that to illustrate how we can save energy. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the data hall. In the data hall, what do you do? The architecture is then when power is dis distributed in the data hall, then you pass through a UPS. UPS generally have 95% efficiency. It is a, then it converts into Still, it's a UPS, but still 480 volt. You go through a transformer, you step down to a 208 single phase, okay? Then you distribute the single phase to various cabinet. So here is a power distribution unit, typically have efficiency at 96%. Then in the cabinet level, you go through AC to DC, and then DC to DC conversion, we call the power supply unit, usually carries about 94% efficiency. Then you have generally 12 volts in the back plan of this cabinet, and this 12 volt then powers the processor. So 12 volt powered processors through voltage regulator usually have an efficiency of 88%. You multiply everything together, the total efficiency is 73%. So this is not efficient system. 
Why is it done this way? Because uh, data center was in such a high demand, usually it was done by off-the-shelf equipment, off-the-shelf power supply, uh, assembled a data center this way. So when, when the, the new generation of data centers, so such as a Google, company like Google and Facebook, start to look at maybe they should uh, consider a different power architecture. At least in the cabinet level, in the server level, and uh, traditionally it's 12 volt bus. In the cabinet, per cabinet, you will consume about 15 kilowatt uh, power. Now, you're, you're talk, talking about for 12 kilowatt power, you're talking about 1,000 ampere bus bar on the back part of the cabinet. Then each drawer is a server drawer. Each drawer is plugged in and connect to the bus bar and take the power you needed for that. So there's a loss in the 12 volt bus bar, a tremendous amount of current. And one of these drawer then is a power drawer. So you you un, you plug you take this drawer out, then you have a power supply. There are modular power supply. Each module looks like this to give you a um, two kilowatts or so power. Okay, so that's the current structure. Now when Google look at this, they think Google say we can do better. So what, how, do, how do, does Google do? First of all, they get rid of the UPS. So when 4160 volt come down through transformer drop to 4, 480 volt, you no longer pass through a UPS system. You're directly distributing this from the, from line to neutral. So it'd be 277 volt AC directly send it to the uh, server cabinet. So now the efficiency by the efficiency, the power power distribution unit now is 99 percent. AC to DC, DC to DC converter. The target is 98 plus for AC to DC, 97 for DC to DC. The uninterrupted power supply now it become a battery that is not in series with the power flow path, but in parallel. At a 48 volt DC bus, you provide the UPS. Then you send the power to VR. So VR will receive 48 volt input and uh, deliver one volt to the processor. And if you calculate the efficiency, that's 80%, 7% improvement in efficiency. How, what would that mean? It means equivalent to the output of a 32 nuclear power plant. Okay, now if you look at the cabinet level, now we're talking about a 48 volt bus and uh, at an equal amount of power then would be a 260 volt 260 ampere current. So the bus bar loss is significantly reduced. Now, where is the UPS system? When you take this drawer out, you see the power supplies on the drawer, like, like what we had before. Then you have this 1U battery store energy storage system, BP, BPS, that's a battery. And that's your UPS system. So that's Google's. Uh, architecture. More recently, and uh, Google is pushing in that direction, other, other companies are also very, very interested in moving in that direction. Recently, we see a, a request from the International Electronic Manufacturing Initiative that they would like to see a, on the board, on the motherboard, would like to see a 400, a 380 volt a power supply with a 380 volt input convert into 12 volt output. So this structure would be different from Google. Google would put 48 volt converters in here, but this initiative says, why don't we put 380 volt power supply on the board? With deliver 12 volt output and UV, VR would be the same as before, and then I still can have a similar kind of UPS system. By calculating the efficiency in this trend, power trend, there's another 3% improvement in efficiency. But this 
pose a significant challenge. That means the power supply had to be made so small so that it can plug into the motherboard. So you can clearly see there's the embedded power uh, keep moving from a low voltage to a higher voltage, from low power to a higher power level. So our second project is to address this particular uh, uh, initiative, another, uh, this particular architecture. So offers a 10 percent energy saving. So by calculating in terms of amount of energy savings equivalent to 46 nuclear power plant output. Okay, so architecture changes would result in dramatic energy saving. So the challenge here is the DC-DC converter. Now in this architecture, the, the back plant power will be 380 volt. The current will be only 30 amp. You open the drawer here, there is no power supply anymore because the power supply is already in the other drawer mounted on the motherboard. So what you have here left is just a battery unit, a 1U battery unit. So the entire cabinet has very little power associated with it, only the battery. Now, if you see what the today's practice, AC to DC is done this way. You go through a filter, you go through a bridgeless rectifier circuit, you go through a DC-DC converter. This is the state of the art current industry practice with 96% efficiency, roughly about 30 watt per cubic inch. Now, you, you can't possibly take this power supply and plug in the motherboard, expect it to work with that architecture. So there has to be a dramatic change in the design practice. We have to address all issue. What do we do with the filter, what do we do with PFC, what we would do with the DC-DC converter? What I have marked here is uh, the current practice, roughly around 100 kilohertz for PFC, 100 to 200 kilohertz for DC-DC converter. Okay, so what we want is take this unit, dissect it, and put them together. This would be a PFC circuit. This would be a DC-DC converter circuit, and this, in terms of power density, this would be a popular factor of five improvement over the current practice. Frequency, in order to achieve that, we're pushing frequency at least 10 times or higher into a megahertz range. Efficiency, we want to be at least the same efficiency maybe better. Power density, we want at least a 10 times improvement in power density. Of course, this particular calculation did not include in the bulk cap. Bulk cap is pretty large, too. But on, the, on this structure, the AC to DC is not on the board. The DC to DC is on the board. We're talking about uh, somewhere around 800 watt per cubic inch power density. And the left-hand side, the labor intensive, the right-hand side can be entirely automated. Now let me show you how we give you an idea how we are able to shrink the size that way. This is a conventional design. Resonant converter, you have a transformer, you have a resonant inductor. Both are very bulky. Capacitors, the resonant capacitors are very bulky as well. So all this has to be replaced by something much smaller. So if we use a traditional way, uh, you cannot con possibly contemplating your converter having break down the transformer into one transformer into eight. If you break down one transformer into eight, transformer can be implemented in PCB, but it's very large because the transformer size is determined by the output side instead of the input side. So the first thing we have to do is increasing the frequency by 10 times. So you can shrink the transformer to one-tenth of it, but this will be slightly smaller than the conventional practice, but still large. 
The next thing is you can integrate them together. Eight transformer you can integrate into four. Then now this this would be 40% of the original. So by breaking it down into eight transformer by integrating them into four, you have significant size reduction. Now why do I do this? Because I want to completely change the way we make transformer using PCB winding structure. So when I make a winding structure from 16 to 1 to 1 to 12 to 2 to 1 to 1, because I have 8, 16 divided by 8 it will be 2. So two turns in the primary side, one turns in the secondary side. That structure is so simple, you can simply do it in PCB. So here is the illustration in the primary side. You have two turns. So you wrap around two cores in the primary side that will look like this. This picture is to show you how to integrate them together. And if I wrap this winding in the reverse polarity than this winding, then I can bring them to back together and I have a cancellation effect in the flux. Therefore, I can reduce one, two core into one core. This is how the integration is able to cut the number of core into half. You go through the similar ex exercise, eight transformer become four transformer, and the winding structure are eight transformer winding structure, and you have a, all the winding are in the four layer PCB, and you adding four core on top of it, uh, you have a transformer. So here's a four transformer structure, actually had the eight transformer windings. And this thing has efficiency, is able to reach efficiency of 97%. It is what, this is what the target efficiency by the uh, International um, Electronic Manufacturing Association Initiative. So only four layer board, efficient 97%, and this thing is much smaller. 700 watt per cubic inch. Okay, I would think the cost of making this would be also significantly less than the cost using the conventional way of doing it. Now, if you run the improved EMI, you can add two layers of shielding, and this two layer shielding would allow you to again have a dramatic reduction of EMI noise uh, for this converter. What does that lead to? That lead to a, a better EMI or a smaller input filter required. So in summary, we are able to demonstrate a structure with a power density uh, right at the target value, or maybe slightly higher than the target value. This particular one runs 400 volt to 12 volt with one kilowatt power, and the frequency is variable frequency, and is beyond one megahertz and this thing is fully automated. So size-wise, there is a factor of seven improvement. Okay, then this part, the front end AC to DC converter, you use a two magnetic. These two magnetic are all core and hand-wound windings. So we want to change that structure as well. By coupling the magnetic together, by adding two more small magnetic, these two small magnetic inductor is to reduce the common mode noise for balancing. Another technique we invented in CPAS to reduce the common mode noise. So now you have a full inductor structure. How do I use a, let me, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit myself, okay. We have to run this to, realize zero voltage switching by running critical mode. But by simply running critical mode, you are not able to do zero voltage switching. We have to modify that concept, the profile of duty cycle in order to run the fully zero voltage switching. And uh, we are able to get efficiency very close to 99. And uh, another feature is uh, the THD is slightly higher then, then, then the requirement, so we have to, again, modify the profile of duty cycle in order to in, improve the uh, THD requirement. So here is a variable uncontrolled 
were using to simply reduce the THD. Now, now the, this third one is the most challenging one. How are these four core can be integrated? Nobody at this point has able to demonstrate a integration of in, inductor. Integration of transformers being done by integration integration of inductors never being demonstrated to be effective. So we are making a coupling between the two inductors and then between the top inductors and bottom inductors. And, then, and all this can be done in a six-layer PCB board, okay? And the, the detail, I don't have time to go over. The, the structure of the design is a bit more unconventional. And, uh, and in order to get it, so the efficiency of this transformer inductor is the same as the conventional one, but size-wise is much less. And also the common mode noise is significantly reduced. So finally, we have a similar prototype for the PFC circuit. By doing all, the, all these things, the front end only required to use a single stage filter, which no commercial product is able to do that today. Okay, so here is the total picture. The front end AC to DC looks like this, and DC to DC looks like this. Frequency is 10 times higher, efficiency is slightly better, power density is also about 10 times better. And uh, what we are currently doing is uh, try to target on this bulky transformer, 60 year transformer, and then replace that with solid state transformer, something like this. And if you calculate all the power trend loss, there's another three degree improvement in efficiency. So you got four, 400 volt DC directly coming out of solid state transformer, then you can send it to the uh, server. And on the server, you have this DC DC converter. You can see in this structure, there is no AC to DC anymore because AC DC and is taken care of in the solid state transformer part of it. So this would be, be even better. And uh, I think we have a solution that can deal with this. And, and current, well, our current project is to work on solid state transformer. Okay, if this is done, there's a 60, there's another 30 degree energy saving. Okay, I think I'm done with my presentation. I only left uh, seven minutes for Q&A. I don't have time to talk about this structure, but basically these are just details in case that you have questions and so on. Ask. This is all easy to DC. The only thing that cannot be automated is this bulky transformer, uh, capacitor. Capacitor size can be reduced, as I mentioned, using the third auto harmonic injection. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, and uh, informative presentation and uh, very timely as well. Uh, one earlier question uh, from the audience was, will these slides be made available? And the answer to that is to members of Power America, the answer is yes. To non-members of Power America, that's at the discretion of uh, Dr. Lee. Okay. Uh, the second question is, what is the hold-up time requirement of Google AC to DC rectifier, 20 milliseconds or much less because of the 48 volt battery? I'm not sure I'll catch the question. Yeah, that's not a very clear question, but that's exactly what it means. What is the hold up time requirement of the Google AC to DC rectifier? In here, there is in server, in data center, there's no hold up requirement. In offline power supply, yes, there's a hold up requirement. And let me ask my graduate student, when you design PFC,
front end. Did, did you address hold up requirement? Uh, that the capacitor I mentioned earlier. This uh, this cap is not addressing the hold up time. The answer is the for data center. I don't think there's a hold up time requirement. You you got the UPS this 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 system in there. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, then I'd like to wrap things up. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lee again very much for two very, very interesting technical presentations. And uh, for everyone online, please join us again on the 7th of September. Where we'll have two separate uh, presentations from Power America again. I will send, up, send out uh, the WebEx information and other uh, background information for those uh, within the next few weeks. So thank you for joining us again, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. We okay, will thank see you, you very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Yep, thanks.